For day three of Stoic Week 2015, I wanted to focus on another text by Cicero, the On Duties, or De Officius, um, a classic text having to do with, with ethics, and largely from a Stoic perspective. Cicero, again, uh, let me remind you, is not himself a Stoic. He actually, at certain points, identifies with the academic skeptic school. But when it comes to matters of ethics, and even to a certain extent political theory, he more often aligns himself with the Stoics and with the Aristotelians or Peripatetics, and on some of the matters in this book in particular, he really aligns himself up closely with the Stoics against the Aristotelians. So um, he is a very important representative of um, certain interpretations of Stoicism, in part because what he's doing is, while not necessarily endorsing views himself, he will, he will place them in his text. In this case, it's a little bit different. Um, this one is addressed to his son. It's not a dialogue. It's rather a treatise. There's a brief introduction. Uh, and then the rest of it is primarily exposition of the issues and the doctrines. And he, you know, he's focusing on, on ethics there. It's um, referring to and engaging a middle Stoic thinker, um, this guy, Panateus, um, who had written a, a work on duties himself. We don't have that, unfortunately. All we really have are Cicero's references to it and a few other classical references as well, and that gives us um, what we have of that text. But in this work, if you go on to read it, and I, I very highly encourage you to read this, um, this work, not only for Stoic Week, but also because it played an important role in the history of ideas. This, this work influenced a lot of people over, over the years. What we find is that Cicero not only um, tells us some of the things that, that, that his predecessor, Panateus the Stoic, who was interested in adopting what was useful from other perspectives, like the Platonic and the Aristotelian perspective, he tells us what that person uh, taught, but he also criticizes it and tries to go further than it. So um, he tells his son, going back to you know, sort of the, the beginning of this, that he's going to present the ethics here, or rather the parts of ethics that have to do with duties in particular, in a more or less stoic position. Um, he says, look, there's only certain uh, schools that can actually lay a claim to having an ethics. The stoics are one of them. Um, I'm going to, you know, try to try to give you the best that I can from their perspective, and he really does. He goes into great detail in this text. Um, he criticizes Panateus's presentation because he says Panateus only focused on three of these main aspects. I'm going to focus on all five. Um, one of them is moral goodness and badness, or um, in, in the Latin, the honestum and the turpe from which we get turpitude, right? If you've ever heard that word moral turpitude, and you wondered what that meant, it means badness. It means badness in a absolute way. Um, honestum means uh, good intrinsically good. So that is, that is the good for the Stoics. And then um, there's expediency or usefulness. Um, should be a U in there. Uh, and that refers to the Latin utile or utilitas, the word that we get utility from, and the utilitarians later on would pick up on, on that, that term. Um, that is another important consideration in ethics. And then conflicts between moral goodness and expediency. Should you do what will be useful, or should you do what is morally good or right? This is a classic question, one that people have had to grapple with over and over again. And again, just like with the, the previous text, um, the, uh, On the Ends, long after you and I are gone, um, you know, millennia after Cicero is gone and we have shuffled off the stage, there are going to be people debating these questions, not because there aren't any answers to them, but because it takes time to understand the answers and we need good guides for that. And that's part of what Cicero is providing us with. 
he's going to improve on uh, Penetius's um, examination of things by saying he left out two important subjects. Um, this one here, how to choose between two morally good or right options. What do you do when you're faced with uh, two competing goods and you don't seem to be able to satisfy both of them? Like, you know, he has the example uh, somewhere in the text, I'm thinking it's in book one, um, that you, uh, you made a commitment to somebody to show up at a particular time to defend them in court. Cicero was a lawyer. And your son falls sick and is about to die. Which one do you follow through on? Do you say, well, I made the obligation, I can't go, I can't stay with my son who is sick. Um, or do you say, well, you know, that obligation is going to have to wait or somebody else will have to handle it. He'll understand. You, you have to choose one or the other. You can't be in both places at the same time. Uh, there is a third option, which is do nothing or <laughs> go somewhere else, but Cicero doesn't consider that. And Cicero is willing to handle these sorts of moral dilemmas and examine them. So if you like moral dilemmas, this is a book that you want to check out. Um, similarly, how do we choose between two expedient options? Um, you know, when we're talking about goods that are, that are goods of expediency, we're talking about things like wealth and um, position. Um, do you, you know, do you favor one or do you favor the other? How do you choose between relationships that you, you have? How do you set them in a kind of hierarchy? This is a classic question in ethics, and Cicero is grappling with this in, in quite a lot of detail. You can tell this is a, a rather lengthy uh, volume. Of course, this is the, the Latin on one side and the Greek on the other. The Latin on one side and the English on the other, not the Greek. Cicero was translating Greek into Latin for, for his, uh, his audience. Um, so it's about twice as long as it needs to be. But even so, it would still be a, a rather you know, substantive uh, treatise on, on ethics. So um, what I'm going to do is just focus on a few interesting aspects of this text, not trying to go over the entire thing. That would actually take uh, quite a lot of video footage. Um, if I were teaching this in, in a class, it would take more than one class session. Um, and what I want to focus on in particular is Cicero's treatment of the virtues in here and how that fits into this question of afficies or moral duties. You'll notice on the board that I have four character traits picked out here. Those are what are called the cardinal virtues. And the Stoics were not the first people to organize the you know, good habits of character or good character traits, the forms, distinctive forms of human moral goodness into this schema. Um, you know, we find this, for example, in Plato's Republic. And we're going to see many other people you know, use this schema of the virtues besides the Stoics, but the Stoics got a lot of mileage out of this, and Cicero is going to in this work. So moral goodness, he says, the honesta, the, that which is intrinsically valuable, um, has four parts or modes, you might say, for human beings. He says, um, you see here, Marcus, the very form and, as it were, the face of moral goodness. And if, as Plato says, it could be seen with the physical eye, it would awaken a marvelous love of wisdom. And then Cicero goes on to say, all that is morally right arises from someone of four sources. That's how it's translated here. The Latin is actually, um, it's an omna, quod est honestum, everything that is, that is morally good, that is moral goodness, id quatro par partium oritur ex aliqua. Um, uh, it arises out of, out of uh, one of these four parts. Um, it, it stems from one of these things. So I use the word mode here because that works as well. You can think of this virtue is a totality, um, but it's also divisible into these aspects, these different ways of being virtuous. So what are they? Cicero goes on and says, um, it's either concerned with full perception and development of the true, a grasping of the true by the human being. We, the Cicero's think that the Stoics 
and Cicero, of course, thinks that we have a, a natural propensity towards desiring truth and towards being averse to falsehood when we recognize it as such. And that is reflected in this. Wisdom is this orientation towards attaining the truth that does, in fact, attain the truth and comes to understand, comes to perceive what is true. So that's an important part of moral goodness. And he says another important part is concerned with the conservation of society, with giving each person his or her due, giving them what they deserve, giving them what they merit, and with faithfully executing the obligations undertaken. Well, that part is what we call justice. And the Stoics thought that that was uh, incredibly important as well. Cicero is going to say that this part right here is, in certain respect, most human, and then justice is the second most important of these. The third one, uh, concerned with greatness and strength of a noble spirit, well, that's courage. Um, Cicero is going to talk quite a bit about what the conditions for real courage, as opposed to just being aggressive or being angry, are. And nobility of spirit is, is going to be part of that. Responding to the sorts of difficulties and threats and hazards that will inevitably arise, um, not only for oneself, but for those whom one cares about, those whom one is obligated to, to take care of and to serve. That requires courage. And then finally, uh, to top it off, we have the virtue that is concerned with orderliness and moderation of everything said and done. And I put and desired here as well, because later on when he's discussing temperance, he is going to say explicitly um, that it has to do with our appetites. It has to do with how we subordinate our affective side of our personality, our drives, to rationality, to living a, a fully rational life. So each one of these is a part of moral goodness. He goes on and he says, Although these four are connected and interwoven, still it is in each one considered singly that certain definite kinds of moral duties have their origin. So when we, when we get to know what indeed you know, wisdom is, or justice is, or courage is, or temperance is, and that goes beyond just having a definition, you know, that, that involves comprehension. When we get to know this, and we get to know this in part through you know, studying and being taught, but also in part through acting, through becoming habituated by doing the right thing so that we can then recognize what the right thing really is and, and how, you know, what sort of effects it has as opposed to its opposite. When we do that, we start to realize what some of our obligations or duties, our officia, are. Um, the, the, the things that we, we are supposed to be doing. Remember, officium is the Latin translation of the, the Greek term that was used by people like Epictetus and you know, Zeno and, and other Stoics um, to mean some sort of you know, duty or obligation, the katheko. So he goes on and he says, in this category, for instance, which is designated first in our division, that's wisdom, and in which we place wisdom and prudence, belong the search after truth and its discovery. Notice what he's saying there. The search after truth and its discovery, that's not something purely optional for human beings. That's something that's incumbent upon us. It doesn't mean we all have to become scientists or we all have to become moral philosophers or anything like that. Um, but we do have to seek out truth, at least to the, the degree that we need it, to the degree that is going to enhance our lives and allow us to exercise our faculties and, and exercise these other virtues in wise and prudent ways. So it's, it's very important. Uh, he says, um, the more clearly anyone observes the most essential truth in any given case, and the more quickly and accurately he can see and explain the reasons for it, the more understanding and wise he is generally esteemed, and justly so. So it is truth that is, as it were, the stuff which, with which this virtue has to deal, and on which it employs itself. And then he says, 
Before the three remaining virtues, on the other hand, is set a different task. The task of providing and maintaining those things on which the practical business of life depends. Cicero is very much about the practical business of life. As a matter of fact, he is going to differ from philosophers like, say, Plato, who would be content to, to you know, contemplate the, the, the good and, and the forms and stuff like that, uh, you know, a life withdrawn from practical life, uh, a life just of wisdom. Cicero says, no, the, the active life is really much more important. That's where we, we uh, live out our distinctively human good. So even wisdom is going to be connected with what we can do in our, in our life. But there are these other virtues that are directly concerned with what we do, how we get by, how we get along with other people, um, what we make of ourselves, um, what we pass on to others. And so he says, um, these are set the task of providing and maintaining those things on which the practical business of life depends, so that the relations of man to man and human society may be conserved, and that largeness and nobility of soul may be revealed not only in increasing one's resources and acquiring advantages for oneself and one's family, but far more in rising superior to those very things. The Stoic understanding of courage is not just about you going out and getting everything that you need or getting everything that your family needs. It's, it's in part about disciplining yourself so that you don't need quite so much, so that you can live a noble life, uh, not just a life of consumerism <laughs> or a life of competition. And then he says... Um, uh, orderly behavior and consistency of demeanor and self-control and their like have their sphere in that department of things in which a certain amount of physical exertion and not mental activity merely is required. For if we bring a certain amount of propriety and order into the transactions of daily life, we shall be conserving moral rectitude, moral rightness, honesta honestatum, and moral dignity, deca, dignity, um, that which is, is uh, befitting to us. So all of these are constituents of the good life for the Stoics. They all require a lot of work on our part in order to uh, bring about. And, you know, some of that work is, we might say, you know, sitting down and actually doing it kind of work, making the tough choices. Some of it is self-analysis, figuring out, um, you know, what makes us the way that we are as individuals, not just as you know, human beings as such, or classes of people. Uh, and part of it is the work of coming to think out what obligations would stem from these. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of these um, in the course of this video. I highly encourage you to read this book. It's wonderful. You'll get so much out of it if you do. I'm going to focus in on two of these and just certain aspects of them that I find the most interesting uh, in this, this particular work. I'm going to talk about justice and I'm going to talk about courage and then I'll wrap up by um, bringing up one other interesting consideration that we find in this work. In Cicero's portrayal of the Stoic moral theory in the On Duties, in book one primarily, he um, talks about justice, and the Stoics very highly valued justice. They saw a great many obligations or duties stemming from justice because it applies in so many areas and aspects of human life, not just, say, family life or financial transactions, but even warfare. He talks about, you know, what is allowable in war and what's not. We have the beginnings of a just war theory here in many respects, which is quite interesting. Um, and he says a few things here that I want to focus in on, uh, on particular. There's quite a few pages devoted to justice, and I, again, highly encourage you to read it. One is that he says that the foundation of justice itself is um, what the translator is rendering as good faith, or we might actually say something like, you know, loyalty or being a stand-up guy, you know, to use an idiom that maybe some of us are familiar with. Good faith, actually following through, actually doing what a person ought to do. Fidelity and truth, he says, as to promises and agreements. That is at the core 
of justice. There's certain things that we either explicitly or implicitly have undertaken. And, you know, it's, it's unjust if we don't do those sorts of things. We have a, a duty, we have a, a ficium uh, to, to do things in a certain way. So if I'm going to get married to somebody, I should actually get married to them and follow through on the commitments that I make in getting married. Otherwise, don't do it. You know, if you don't like the vow of saying that you need to be faithful to your spouse, then don't get that sort of thing going and uh, pick some other vows instead. Because if you commit to it, uh, Cicero would say, well, you know, you're, you're in that. If I'm going to teach a class, um, I ought to teach that class well. And I ought to grade the students fairly. And we can see all sorts of other duties sort of unfolding from this. Um, he also talks about injustice as some, you know, sometimes it's a matter of actually doing wrong to other people. And then we can say, look, you're being unjust. You're defrauding somebody. You're, you're extorting money from them. You're not shouldering your fair share of the tax burden or something along those lines. But there are a lot of cases where we're unjust, not by actively doing something, but by, by choosing not to get involved when somebody else is doing something wrong. Um, when we have a friend, for example, who is going off the deep end, and we, don't, we, don't, we say, well, that's too bad for them, um, kind of a cool drama show to watch them spiral down into the depths, but I'm not going to get involved because, you know, uh, I don't really want to be overstepping my bounds. Cicero would say, well, what's wrong with you? Is that your friend? You actually do need to say something then. You need to, as we say, step up. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of cases where injustice can be done by inaction, by, by omission, as, as we call it. Um, so that's a very important point as well, I think. And then he also talks about um, something else that's very interesting. In this section on justice, he talks about something that we often, in, in when we're thinking about our morality, we see as going beyond the requirements of strict justice. And we can ask ourselves, is this part of justice or isn't it? For the Stoics, it really was part of justice, if justice is understood as a virtue, as something in one's character. Um, but a lot of people want to say, no, justice just goes this far, and then beyond that, it would be something else, like charity, or benevolence, or, in this case, he talks about justice itself, and beneficence, beneficientia, in, in Latin. And this beneficientia, um, this, is, this is going beyond, this is what we would call kindness, uh, which is... Uh, uh, another term that he uses there, benignitatis, um, is translated as kindness. Um, literally being good to another person. Bene means, means well or, or good. Generosity, liber, libertatis in Latin. Um, generosity is doing more than you're actually required to by the strict rules. But it is part of justice. It is part of what a good person, a person who is good in that respect, is, is going to do. And will actually want to do, and will almost do instinctively in those sort of situations. They don't have to force themselves so much. Um, and we all know what that's like, <laughs> forcing ourselves to do the right thing. Now, Cicero says something else that's really interesting about he does not endorse a sort of passion-driven, enthusiastic, oh, I'm going to give everything to everybody sort of approach to this. He says that really wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be just. And we're posed with this problem. Who actually does deserve, or who has the best claim, who do we have a duty towards when it comes to going above and beyond? That's a Interesting question, isn't it? So he says, um, he says, nothing appeals more to the best in human nature than this, but it calls for the exercise of caution in many particulars. We must, in the first place, see to it that our act of kindness shall not prove to be an injury either to the object of our beneficence or to others. So, you know, um, giving the drug addict money to go buy drugs is not actually an act of kindness. It's a, it's a mistaken 
act of harming them. It's committing an injustice. If you know that somebody else has bad tendencies, uh, you don't give them a bunch of armaments or a bunch of money or resources if they're going to go beat up on their neighbors. Because you're not being good to anybody by doing that. You're just being sort of apparently good. You're putting on the, you know, the facade of, of goodness. He says, second, um, it shall not be beyond our means. You know, there's a tendency to want to give, and that's something good in us. But we shouldn't make ourselves destitute as a result. We have to give out of our surplus, as, as they say. Um, and then he says, finally, and this is the most interesting part, that it shall be proportioned to the worthiness of the recipient. For this is the cornerstone of justice. And by the standard of justice, all acts of kindness must be measured. So he says, for those who confer a harmful favor upon someone they seemingly wish to help are accounted not generous benefactors, but dangerous sycophants. Likewise, those who injure one man in order to be generous to another are guilty of the same injustice as if they diverted their own accounts, to their own accounts, the property of their neighbors. So, you know, we have to take into account the character of the person who we're, we're dealing with. He talks a little bit more about this uh, later on. He says, the third rule laid down was that in acts of kindness, we should weigh with discrimination the worthiness of the object of our benevolence. We should take into consideration his moral character, his attitude towards us, the intimacy of his relations to us, and our common social ties, as well as the services he has hitherto rendered to our interest. You know, this is a, you might say, well, this sounds awfully selfish, but think about it in this way. Do you owe your friends and family more than you owe to some random stranger on the street? If you think that you do, then you could be a Stoic, right? Because uh, they, they said, of course, you know, you, you owe more to them. You should be, you know, you, if you only have a certain amount of putting up with other people's nonsense that you can do, put up with your kids' nonsense, put up with your spouse's nonsense, put up with your brother's and sister's nonsense, put up with your parents' nonsense, put up with your close friends' nonsense, and don't worry about those people over there. If you only have so much that you can give, you need to look for the worthiest objects of that. Otherwise, you're being unjust, he says. Um, he goes on and he says, it's to be desired that all these considerations should be combined in the same person. If they're not, then the more numerous and the more important considerations must have the greater weight. And then he goes on and he says, um, you know, since this seems a little harsh, right? He says, now the men we live with are not perfectly and ideally wise. But men who do very well, if there is found in them but the semblance of virtue. Cicero is, is not as demanding as some virtue ethicists in saying, well, you know, everybody needs to be virtuous all the time. He says, that's actually pretty rare. That takes a lifetime to achieve. So when we're deciding who we're going to help out, we're usually uh, in a situation where we're helping out those who are not yet virtuous, and hoping that it might help them towards becoming virtuous. And we also look at ourselves and say, we're not completely virtuous ourselves. As a matter of fact, some of us may be quite far from it, and we need to exercise in order to get there, uh, and, and we can easily identify with the other person who we might want to show kindness to. So he says, um, you know, the more that a person is developing towards virtue, the more they deserve to be favored. Um, now notice with the one that it doesn't include there, he says, he says, I don't mention fortitude, for a courageous spirit in a man who has not attained perfection and ideal wisdom is generally too impetuous. It's to those other virtues that seem more particularly to mark the good man. So we have a, a lot of different duties or obligations stemming from this virtue, which we may not have at this point, but we're on our way towards if we make efforts of justice. Within ancient culture, courage was a character trait that was particularly valued, and it still is in many respects in many parts of our own modern culture today. One of the key questions, though, is, well, what is courage, and when is a person truly courageous? And to that question, 
there are many different answers that have been given. Not all the answers map onto each other. There are some cases where a person seems to be courageous, but isn't really exhibiting courage, but rather something else, something that could be, in fact, a vice. So Cicero, uh, on this matter, he really does take the side of the Stoics. Um, he says that courage involves a exaltation, a latio, of spirit, animi, in times of, of danger. And this is something that we do need. We need it not only <clears throat> um, in order to defend society, in order to protect the weak, and uh, to keep people from being oppressed and being dominated. We also need it with respect to our own lives and facing up to the difficulties and the challenges that we run into. You know, things ranging from, you know, students who are afraid to do public speaking to professors who, uh, you know, I, I see them at conferences and they're freshly minted and they're reading their paper and their hands are shaking and I just feel bad for them watching that happen because I remember what that was like, uh, re you know, first starting out to, you know, dealing with the specter of, you know, meaninglessness or poverty, all these sorts of things that are possibilities for, for us. Um, courage is something that's needed. Courage is something that gets us through that. Now, Cicero really stresses this second point very strongly. He says, if courage lacks justice, if it fights for selfish ends and not for the common good, it's really not a virtue at all. It's really the opposite. It's really a vice. It's really something <clears throat> that is morally bad. Um, it's, a, it's a character trait that we don't want to have and we shouldn't be praising in other people. As a matter of fact, courage in that sense can end up going so far as to become the sort of aggression that the Latins called crudelitas. We, we translate that as, as cruelty. Um, and you know, if you look at what happened in the Roman Empire, you can see all sorts of horrible examples of how cruel people could be towards each other. Um, sometimes saying that what they were doing was actually courageous. The Stoics define courage as the virtue that champions the cause of the right. So unless you're actually taking up the, the good fight, you're not being courageous according to the Stoics or according to Cicero. And what does that require? That requires that you, first of all, know what the right thing is, that you're not totally mistaken or blinded by ambition or avarice or lust or any of these other things that can lead us astray or listening to flatterers. Um, it also requires not only that you know what the genuine good at stake is, what the right thing to do is, it requires that you choose it, that you commit to it, that you say, I will defend this. I will jump into the breach and take the possibility of taking the hit for those who, who require it. It means serving the common good. <clears throat> the common good perhaps of the family, perhaps of, of uh, you know, friends, perhaps of the nation as a whole. You know, he talks about that as well. So um, we have to watch out for a couple different things here. He says, from this exaltation of spirit, um, there's a danger because, you know, we're being aroused when we're being courageous. This, this part of us that gets riled up is engaged. That's the part that is also tied in with this desire to dominate others. It's literally a, a cupiditas, a, a desire for rulership. Self-will here is a translation of pertinacia. So you could think of self-will as in not just being selfish, like being a greedy person, but being so assertive that you always got to get in everybody's face. Um, that's something that courage when it's not properly regulated by justice and by wisdom, can degenerate into. And then it ceases to be courage. It becomes something different. Um, he also cautions us about, <clears throat> about anger. And um, Cicero actually has quite a few interesting things to say about the emotion of anger. Uh, I'm going to read some of them here. I, I actually brought these up last year during Stoic Week because he says so many interesting things. He uh, says that, um, 
Here we go. Um, when we're involved in strife against other people, we have to avoid getting angry with them. He says, we shouldn't listen to those who think that one should indulge in violent anger against one's political enemies and imagine that such is the attitude of a great spirited, a great soul, a magnanimous in, in the, the old term, brave man. He says, for nothing is more commendable, nothing more becoming in a preeminently great man than courtesy and forbearance. To actually be able to treat other people well and not to be so rough towards them, not to get so irritated with them, that's, that's not, um, you know, those sort of things are not the sign of a courageous person. Those are the signs of a angry person who, that part of them, that, get, that should, courage should be there. Instead, it's just anger that, that's dominating. He goes on and he says, um, indeed, in a free people where all enjoy equal rights before the law, we must <coughs> school ourselves to affability and what is called mental poise. For if we are irritated when people intrude on us at unseasonable hours or make un unreasonable requests, we shall develop a sour, churlish temper, prejudicial to ourselves and offensive to others. So gentleness of spirit and forbearance are to be commended with the understanding that strictness may be exercised for the good of the state or when, when need be. Um, so there, there, are, there are occasions where we have to act like we're angry. We have to be strict with people. But again, it's only when it's serving the common good, not when it's just advancing our own cause, not when we're being driven by passion. That's not courageous. That's just being kind of a jerk. He goes on and he actually says, um, uh, here we go. Um, if anyone proceeds in a passion to inflict punishment, he will never observe the happy mean which lies between excess and defect. The doctrine of the mean is approved by the peripatetics, that's the Aristotelians, and wisely approved. If only they did not speak in praise of anger and tell us it is a gift bestowed on us by nature for a good purpose. In reality, Anger is in every circumstance to be eradicated, and it is to be desired that they who administer the government should be like the laws, which inflict punishment not by wrath, but by justice. When we have to be firm with people, when we have to be strong, we can do so, the Stoics thought, without passion, without you know using anger as kind of a crutch. Anger and courage are dissociated from each other for the Stoics. Um, he does have one other thing that he says that I thought would be interesting. I didn't have the time to put it up here on the board as I was writing it, but I did dog ear it. <clears throat> he says, the soul that is altogether courageous and great is marked above all by two characteristics. Such a person cherishes the conviction that nothing but moral goodness and propriety deserves to be either admired or wished for or striven after, and that he ought not to be subject to any man or any passion or any accident of fortune. This is very typical Stoic views. Being courageous means in part not being out of control, but being free of the sorts of things that would be driving us, like you know, when we're in an angry state. Um, the other key thing, he says, is when the soul is disciplined in the way above mentioned, one should do deeds not only great <clears throat> and in the highest degree useful, but extremely arduous and laborious and fraught with danger both to life and to many things that make life worth living. That is the kind of heroic courage that the Stoics uh, would admire. This is part of why they took Hercules as one of the heroes that they sought to emulate. Socrates on the one side, Hercules on the other, other people like Epictetus coming after Cicero, of course, uh, later on. So we see a very different picture of courage here than we might see coming from other philosophers. Towards the end of his discussion of the virtue of temperance and some of the other things that are allied with it, Cicero says something really quite remarkable, at least in my view, and it has to do with propriety, which is how we translate the Latin decorum, that which is uh, befitting, that which decet, you know, decade is um, to be befitting to a particular person. And here we're talking about individuality or the specific nature of a 
person as opposed to some other person? What makes us who we are? And he says everyone should cultivate his or her own gifts, so long as they're not vicious. So, you know, if you think that your gift is being a sadist, Cicero would say, yeah, don't do that. But everything else, you know, we're, we're endowed with different gifts. Some of us do have a, a greater bent towards wisdom, and others do have a greater bent towards, you know, properly regulated courage, and others do have a you know, better bent towards justice, particularly in terms of kindness. Um, we're not all made the same. And so we have to try to cultivate the things that are, you know, most appropriate to us, that, that fit us the best. Um, you know, for example, in, in doing these videos, you know, I'm, I'm good, it turns out, at taking ancient texts and also modern texts and explaining them in ways that um, people can relate to. I'm not really great at um, getting into debates with people, in part because I'm, you know, prone to anger, uh, and so debates are not a good thing for me. And I used to try to do that, and it's not really my sort of thing. Other people, great at that sort of thing, uh, ask them to say what's going on in this book, and they, would, they might be at a loss. And that's okay. That's actually quite good. We don't all have to be the same Cicero saying. As a matter of fact, we don't want that. We want variety. We want uh, human nature to show itself in as many different ways as possible, so long as they're not vicious. So he advises that we ought to follow the general laws of human nature, you know, uh, the, the good, uh, the bad, those are not totally different for all of us. He's not a relativist. He's not saying everything's up for grabs. Um, we do have certain duties that, that are incumbent upon all of us. But we also should follow the particular bent of our own nature. So, you know, as a kid, I loved reading. That's part of why uh, these books are available to me, why they speak to me the way that they do. Um, I was fortunate in that I had parents who, you know, let me read as much as I wanted, basically. Even while well, they had a you know, lights out time, but they didn't punish me for uh, reading by the nightlight afterwards. Um, some parents aren't like that. Some parents have a kid who reads and they feel threatened by it. Um, you know, we can say the same thing for musical ability. We can say the same thing for character traits like generosity. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have a child who actually has a tender heart and is generous the way that, that you know, they ought to be, train that child well. Don't try to stifle that. Um, and with respect to our own selves as adults, we want to try to, you know, cultivate the particular bent of our nature. Um, Cicero does think that it's important for us to have what he calls, uh, or what's translated here, as a uniform consistency in our life, right? Um, this is an equitabilis uh, cum universae vitae. Um, but what that means is a way of living that other people can count on. They can say, oh, that's that guy, and that's the way that he, he behaves. I know what I'm getting into when I get into a conversation with him. Here's where it gets really interesting. He says, you're not going to have that by copying the traits of other people and trying to eliminate your own traits. You're not going to be able to have that kind of, you know, running throughout the, the, the whole of your life, um, you're, you're the same person, when you're actually trying to put on a mask, somebody else's clothes, somebody else's costume. Everybody should try to be who they are. Now, uh, Cicero says that requires that we actually fulfill a certain duty. He says, everyone should make a proper estimate of his own natural ability, and show himself a critical judge of his or her own merits and defects. In this respect, we should not let actors display more practical wisdom than we do. When actors decide what plays they're going to do, when I think about an actor going for a uh, audition, they pick the monologue that they can actually do well. You know, when a musician is going to do a recital, they don't pick the, the songs that they can't play, they pick the ones they do the best. Well, we should be like that with ourselves. We should get to know what we are actually good at and what we're not good at so we, we can, we can you know, guide ourselves the right way. He says, um, shall a player have regard to this in choosing his role on a stage and a wise man fail to do this in selecting 
our part in life. We shall therefore work to the best advantage in that role to which we are best adapted. If, if uh, he says, at some time stress of circumstances shall thrust us aside into some uncongenial part, we have to devote a lot of thought, practice, and pain so that we can do it, if not with propriety, at least with as little impropriety as possible. But if we have the chance to, to do what it is that we individually are, you, know, you might say, made to do, then we ought to pursue that. So that requires that we fulfill this old uh, you know, injunction that's above the, the temple of Apollo, Gnothi say out to, know thyself. And philosophers have taken that as, you know, part of the, the injunction to live the examined life. This is part of living the examined life for Cicero. Um, and, and, you know, his particular bent on Stoicism is that we have to get to know ourselves so that we can mold ourselves into the kind of person that we're meant to be.